Hello everybody, recording live from somewhere. This is Zach Couples with episode number 62, six deuce, baby, of the Movement Debrief. And today, folks, tonight, wherever you are, the debrief's gonna be like, whoa. We're gonna talk about rib cage pump handle mechanics. How does that influence things? Why is that important? What happens when you ain't got it? Stay tuned. We're gonna talk about Hip rotation, what does that mean? How do you improve hip rotation? What types of wild and crazy things should we be focusing on to get our hips moving and grooving? That's also on docket tonight. And last but not least, we have compliance. What happens when say, oh, I don't know, your client challenges you and says, yeah, you know, why do I gotta keep doing this stuff? These are questions asked from the people, answered for the people by this people, fam recognized fam. Before I dive in, I don't know if y'all knew this, but, Episode number one of Human Matrix came your way in Seattle, and we got some outstanding reviews. Guys, if you want a seminar that takes your ability to assess movement, improve on movement, not just from a low intensity level, but a high intensity level to help your clients meet their goals, whether that's fat loss or whether that's living in pain freedom, then you definitely want to check out Human Matrix, because it is coming your way. We got two new locations. But first, folks, this Sunday, the 30th, my math serves me right, the early bird discount is almost up for the seminar in Kansas City, Missouri. That's October 27th to 28th. And Portland, November 10th and 11th. You'll want to sign up for those two ASAP. We still have some spots available. After that, though, you're feeling a little frisky. December 8th and 9th, we are going to be hosting another seminar, Human Matrix, in Charleston, South Carolina. And then, getting into 2019 already, fam, in New Providence, New Jersey, February 2nd and 3rd. Be there or be square. If you want to upgrade yourself from fam to OG status, you got to attend. Without further ado, though, let's debrief, shall we? The first question comes from Tim. I'm gonna modify it a little bit. What is the deal when the pump handle is down and how does that impact position or potentially symptoms? Tim, an unbelievable question. Thank you so much for asking. Pump handle, what is that? First, we have to understand normal mechanics. Normal respiratory mechanics if you want a little bit more information, I will link some stuff in the show notes, which will be available on zackcouples.com tomorrow. But pump panel basically is rib cage mechanics, more prominent in the um, front upper portion. But as I take a breath of air in, what should happen is the sternum and the rib cage should move anteriorly and superiorly like this. If that was my rib cage. My pump handle skills are not on fleek, so bear with me. But it should be anterior and superior movement of the rib cage. That is pump handle. When the pump handle is up, boom. It's up like this. When the pump handle's down, we're talking of exhale position. That's the pump handle. Now, how does that impact how maybe tests and measures present? Well, I'm glad you asked. If only I had a scapula and a humerus nearby. Oh, here's one. Okay. So got myself a scat and I got myself a humerus. This is, that is, yeah, this is the right side. When I have a pump handle down position or a bent manubrio sternal joint, because that can also potentially impact symptoms, but that's a topic for another day. Generally, what I will have is more concentric orientation of stuff anteriorly and a little bit laterally. So things get deflated here. When that happens, the scapula would migrate forward in a little bit of abduction and internal rotation because you got stuff on the front pulling it into that direction. Think uh, serratus anterior would be an example, possibly a little pec minor, you know, things that attach to the scap uh, biceps pull things forward into abduction and internal rotation. Now, the humerus follows suit in this case. So it's oriented in a position that is more internal. But here's the deal. If, my, if I'm like this because my pump handle's down, well, you know, I can't use my hand much like this. 
our body craves doing things purpose, purposefully and making sure we can meet the outcomes that help our survival. So in order for me to move to a purposeful orientation, I'm gonna externally rotate, potentially, that humerus. So then as the scap migrates into abduction and internal rotation, the humerus externally rotates compensatorily. Not always, but often. Guess what that's gonna do? Well, when that happens and the humerus goes into external rotation, I get concentric orientation of stuff on the back side, your external rotator muscles. Maybe if you're not like with the concentric and eccentric orientation game like Big Z is, think of it as short. When the ER muscles are concentrically oriented, I'm gonna have a hell of a time going into internal rotation because they won't chill and we need them to chill. They need to be able to eccentrically orient in order for me to appreciate full shoulder internal rotation. So how would a down pump handle impact your presentation? You probably have a limitation in shoulder internal rotation. Now, that leads to the next question is, what you gonna do about it? Here's what you're gonna do. You need to do things that, first off, get air into the upper chest wall so I can restore the pump handle. If it's down, I need to be able to have the sternum go anteriorly and superiorly with a nice breath of air in. <sighs> Feels great. Then, maybe if I do that and I still have some limitations, I might need to move the scapula from a orientation of abduction and internal rotation to adduction and external rotation. And then, Maybe I still got some problems. I might have to do something to IR the humerus. Simple rule, I teach this in human matrix, but put people into orientations that they can't get into, make them suffer. A lot of times you'll see some good things. Now I'll attach some of my favorite activities to get the pump handle to come up. First priority, of course, and I'll make sure this is in the show notes, if y'all don't know what that is, is the infrasternal angle. I need to be able to keep the lower rib cage dropped and in a good uh, orientation, otherwise I'm not gonna be able to drive air interiorly. Because what happens is if I lose the lower rib cage, then all I'm doing is I'm superiorly migrating the rib cage as an entity with accessory musculature. Homie, don't play that. You need to make sure that when you inhale, the lower ribs stay still. If you get it right, you're gonna feel like you're suffocating because a lot of these areas might be concentrically oriented and you probably won't be able to get as much air in early on. That ought to improve the later we go. So first thing, infrasternal angle. Check the show notes tomorrow on zackcouples.com if you wanna learn more about it. From there, the simple thing that I have to do, maybe it's not simple, but stuff on the front and the side, if it's more concentrically oriented, I need to eccentrically orient that stuff. What does that look like? Boom, arms overhead, praise the Lord. When I do this, all this stuff in the front is in more of an eccentric orientation. I don't have any concentric activity because things like the packs and uh, pack minor and even serratus to a degree are more in an eccentric from the rib cage orientation. Because then what I can do is I can breathe in this position and that will encourage the pump handle to come up. That would be step one. Then once you've done that, maybe you got some improvements, but you didn't get it all the way, but it looks like they're filling some air in that chest wall. You move into activities where you're doing um, adduction and external rotation. Think your rows, think your face pulls, think anything that moves the scap back. If that fails, drive the humerus into some IR along with it. Think even some PNF D1 extension, that works wonders. But if you do those things in that order, you ought to be able to restore your pump handle capabilities, you ought to get your shoulders moving, and most importantly, folks, you ought to be in business. So Tim, unbelievable question. The next question comes from Nate. Nate asks, had a question regarding hip rotation and infrasternal infrapubic angles. I recently had an athlete present with um, bilateral lower extremity limitations with a narrow infrasternal angle. She had 
excessive hip internal rotation and was lacking hip external rotation. I just can't wrap my head around this as a narrow infrapubic angle. Is this a situation where the infrasternal angle and infrapubic angle are stuck opposite? Help a bro out. Nate, I will help a bro out. Let's dive into this. I can see why this is confusing. Because what we have is we have normal mechanics that we would expect at the femurs, and then we have compensatory mechanics that we may be seeing in this particular case. So in normal breathing mechanics, when I take a breath of air in, the infrasternal angle, so the lower portion of the rib cage, ought to bucket handle out, so it ought to widen. That corresponds with a narrowed infrapubic angle. When the infrapubic angle narrows, the pelvic floor drops down to catch the goods. Once I've done that, that or we're talking about pelvis there, from the femurs, and this is where it gets a little tricky, normal respiratory mechanics. If I am breathing in and my infrapubic angle narrows, the sacrum is counter -nutated. The sacrum, because there's not much movement at the SI joint, the sacrum is generally going to win the show in terms of relative motions. So, well, from a side view, you might say, oh, well, I get anterior rotation, this whole bad boy is going to be tipped forward. Not so fast. What actually happens is the sacrum goes into counter mutation because spine always wins, and you still have that anterior rotation. It's just, it's all tipped back. I'm trying to get this more upright so the goods can drop right down into the pelvic floor. What happens at the femurs, in, under normal circumstances, when the infrapubic angle narrows, is the femur is going to go into relative extension. You can see that as the sacrum counter mutates, the femurs extend. A B duction. So as I narrow the infrapubic angle, the distance between the uh, pubic ramus, the inferior pubic ramus, and the femur is increased. So A B duction, and it's going to lastly externally rotate. That's a normal inhalation at the femurs. That's why this is confusing because this person who has a narrow IPA or pubic angle has fallen into IR. Let me keep going. When I exhale, what should happen is the infrasternal angle ought to narrow and the infrapubic angle ought to widen. What happens at the femur? I'm glad you asked. Remember, sacrum is going to win. When I get posterior innominate rotation and the infrapubic angle widens, the sacrum nutates, so it's going to tip a little bit more forward. That leads to flexion at the femur. Because the IPA is now widened, it gets closer to the femur, so a deduction and internal rotation. That's normal mechanics. To summarize, and review. Breathe in, sacral counter mutation, the infrapubic angle narrows, the femurs are extended, abducted, and externally rotated. And then when I exhale, sacrum mutates, innominates posteriorly rotate, the infrapubic angle widens, and the femurs are in a relative orientation of flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. Now here's, here's where things run problematic, because if I have normal mechanics, chances are I probably don't have any movement limitations because everything's working hunky-dory as it is, as it should be. But no, when, when the infrasternal and infrapubic angle match, and I have a reduction in movement capabilities, then we want to run into problems. Now, normal mechanics are still at play here. But what can happen sometimes as a means to try to drive motion when motion cannot occur in the axial skeleton, maybe I'm stuck, and I use scare quotes very heavily, but I'm stuck with a narrow infrapubic angle. Maybe I don't have the ability to adduct the femur because I don't have dynamic capabilities at the pelvis. The transverse plane can be used as a compensatory measure to try to drive motion in some way, shape, or form. For example, don't even worry about the model, but if I externally rotate my left femur, 
What that's going to do is that's going to rotate or orient my pelvis to the right. That can be a useful way for me to get over to say right stance if I lack those movement capabilities to do so because degrees of freedom are lost in a particular joint. Now, how does this play into the case that Nate's talking about? In a narrow infracubic angle with movement limitations, what should happen is if I am narrow, remember I have femoral extension, abduction, and external rotation. What can happen as a means to try to drive motion, maybe in this case to try to shift over to one side or the other, or how about this, maybe to try to open up the infrapubic angle because the um, adductor portion of adductor magnus is an internal rotator muscle, but the femur can compensatorily to right back to center internally rotate. Now, I'm sure you guys have probably heard me in the past say that, if not, if you come to a human matrix, I definitely say it. Narrow and pubic angle people are generally more eccentric oriented individuals, lax people. Guess what, folks? When I am in a position or an orientation at the femur of abduction, extension, and internal rotation, that is the closed pack position of the hip. The closed pack position of the hip is when all of the ligaments are taut, or how about this word? Eccentrically oriented. You got some floppy peeps. How about that? Stuff. I almost said shit. Well, now I said shit. Hey, it's my show. I got explicit content anyways. So, that could be a potential reason why an individual with a narrow infrapubic angle has a ton of hip IR because they are not orienting, they're concentrically oriented in an internal rotation. You go test them, holy shnikes, they got a bunch of it, but then they can't shut off those IR muscles, or those ER muscles, I should say, and they lack hip external rotation. You can have the same thing, but in reverse, with a wide infrapubic angle. Remember normal mechanics for that. Flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. As a means to widen the base of support further, you can give femoral external rotation. Which, guess what, folks? If I have flexion and I have external rotation, that gets me a little bit closer to the hip position or orientation that maximizes bony congruency. So I can create more stability by not only widening my base of support, but positioning the hip joints in such a manner that I have greater, I should say bony, but articular congruency. So there's greater contact between the femur, femoral component and the acetabular component, even though it's separated by water, but that's a whole nother topic. So those are two compensatory strategies that you may see. So the real question is, well, Big Z, what you gonna do about someone with a lot of IR and no ER or vice versa? But yes. The first thing, nothing changes. I don't really worry about internal and external rotation as much until I have cleared sagittal and frontal plane. Or how about this? I have cleared, in most people, hip extension. Because a lot of the tests aren't going to matter until you can get extension and a deduction of the hip. What that signifies is I am able to get an infrapubic angle that can move in all directions is dynamic. We want dynamics down there. So what would you do? Well, if I'm narrow, I'm going to do narrow based activities to try to open that up. Think extension and adduction. If I'm wide, what I'm going to do is I'm going to still do hip extension because that still may be limited due to the anterior orientation that happens when the sacrum nutates. But then I might not do drive a deduction activities because I'm already a deducted. Maybe I abduct a little bit, or maybe I just bias things towards um, more neutral, I'll use that in scare quotes, neutral position so I can really drive the hip extension component. You do that, if someone has hip abduction limitations after that, you clean that up. A lot of times, if you get through, through those three steps, or even step one and two, rotation cleans up. Very simple. But not always, 
Sometimes individuals may still have a rotation limitation even after you've legitimately cleared extension and adduction and AB. But I question how often that really does happen. Because as I've redoubled my efforts on, on, efforts on making sure I can get full hip extension with people, um, it's much harder than you think. I will attach two exercises that I really like to drive internal and external rotation. But really what you do, guys, is if you can't IR a femur, you put them into IR somehow. If you can't ER a femur, you put them into ER somehow. So maybe it's a hip IR drill and sideline, which is something I use, or maybe it's a hip ER drill and sideline, like a clamshell, I don't really care. But once you've cleared those other planes first, then you can go and drive rotation. So point being, rotation of the femurs can get kind of confusing once you dive deep into it. But if you clear hip extension, adduction, and abduction, a lot of times it doesn't matter and you'll still be in fitness. So that would be my summary. Nate, unbelievable question. I hope that clarifies things as to why you might get these funky hip measures with people. The last question comes from my dude, Menti Extraordinaire Adil. Or as I try to pronounce his name, Otto. Otto asks, when a client says, it, an exercise, is not hard for me anymore, why do I need to keep doing it? How do you respond? That is a really good question, Otto. Let me try to answer that for you. So I think there's quite a few uh, and there's quite a few areas to attack with this. First off, have you educated them appropriately as to why the activity that you're doing, and I'm sure it's some of the breathing-based stuff that we're doing, matters? How is that going to help them get closer to, closer to their goals? If it's a training standpoint, and let's say the person's goal is fat loss, maybe what that looks like is, hey, so-and-so, you can't squat very well in a manner that doesn't load your or load, in a manner that loads your legs the way we would want to. And I think it might be because you have some movement limitations that are preventing you from doing so. If you do this activity, what that could do is that could help you squat. And if we get you squatting, we get you doing it under wild and crazy amounts of load, that's actually going to increase how hard your muscles are going to work, it's going to increase your calorie burn, and it's going to help you drop some chub if you know what I'm sizzling. Then you've taken something that seems so far away from what their goals are, and you've put meaning to it. You do that, they might be a little bit more Gucci about saying, oh yeah, okay, I'll do that. That would be one thing. If it's a pain standpoint, the spiel that I give people is your body moves as a cohesive unit. A lot of times if you have movement limitations here, here, and here, that might put a little more, that could potentially put more pressure and strain in some of the area, some other areas, possibly areas that you hurt. When that happens, or if we can restore your movement capabilities, what that might do is even out the workload distribution throughout your body and help you with pain. Most people get that. That would be one piece. Make sure it's meaningful and you're helping them bridge the gap towards their goals. The next thing, if it's not hard anymore, why do I need to keep doing it? Maybe we got to make it a little bit more challenging. Before you move on to something that's more challenging first and foremost, make sure they are doing it, whatever activity it is that you have given them correctly. With a lot of the breathing based stuff that I do, and my contemporaries and colleagues do. Most people are not getting the basics right. And I am guilty as sin on that myself. And the reason why is because we see all these fancy smancy moves that we want to try and we have several limitations that we're trying to address. And yeah, gross. What we need to do, folks, is we need to make sure that we have basic components down pat in order to help these people get the most out of those moves. So. The most important, are they getting the breathing component down masterfully? So are they getting a full exhale? Are they getting all their air out? Because what that will do is that will drop the rib cage into a good position to bias the abdominals that you are trying to go for. Are they pausing? 
And here's the big one. Are they keeping the lower rib cage still when they breathe in? Because if they do it right, especially the first time, it's gonna feel like they're gonna suffocate. It's glorious to watch. Don't worry, they don't suffocate, always. If they're not doing that, drive the heck out of that. If you got hands-on skills, push the rib cage down, make it suffer. That's what I do every day, it's wonderful. If you don't have the hands-on skills, have them put their hands on the ribs and have them drive the exhale and make sure they're not moving the lower rib cage on the inhale. That takes so much work for people to get and you can spend a great deal amount of time doing that. And if they don't do that, they might not feel things where they need to feel at one and then they make an exercise that really shouldn't be easy, easy. And the reason why it's easy is because they're not doing it right. right? A squat can be very easy if you just drop down and you're on your tippy toes and come back up but it can be really freaking hard if you're maintaining rib cage position, shooting your knees forward and keeping your pelvis where it needs to be. Another piece. Are you addressing and making sure that they're doing whatever they need to do at the pubic angle like we discussed before, and are they really getting hip extension without back extension? Are they doing the back pocket tuck? And what that is is imagine someone grabbing you by your back pockets and it's pulling them down towards your knees or your heels. That's legit hip extension. Other great cues, scooping your pelvis up underneath you. Or uh, one that I got from Coach Lucy Hendricks, the holistic fitness connector herself. Imagine you are trying to lift one vertebrae up at a time. Those are great cues to make sure that they're getting hip extension. If you can drive a lower rib cage that's still on inhalation and super duper legit hip extension, that's gonna smoke most people and it's gonna be wonderful. If they got that, and they're still saying, it's not hard for me anymore, why do I need to keep doing that? Well, then make it more challenging. If you're doing something with two legs, maybe get them closer to their end range of wherever their movement limitation is. Maybe go to single leg, or maybe go to single arm. But increase the challenge and complexity, and continue to reinforce whatever adaptation you're trying to drive at greater intensities. A lot of times, if you do those things, a dill or a hobble, you ought to be in business. So, to summarize, when it's not hard anymore, make sure you are meeting the client's goals. You're educating them as to why this activity, which seems so far away from their goals, actually is helping them go along the path. Make sure they have the basics down pat, because what you do, a lot of times, is going to make the activities that seem benign incredibly challenging. And last but not least, if you did those things and they're still saying it's not hard, make it more challenging. Adil, unbelievable question, and I think that's a good stopping point for us tonight. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I apologize I didn't do this on that Instagram, baby, but I wanted to see if I switched my phone, if it would have worked on Facebook Live, and I think it did. So thank you guys for tuning in. You're probably wondering, Zach, you are so awesome and kind. Where can I find out more about you? Well, I'll tell you. First, go to ZachCouples.com. While you're there, you'll want to sign up for my newsletter. It's in the right-hand corner. What you're going to get when you sign up for that is four and a half hours of me talking. Like three of it's going to be about breathing, an hour and a half about pain. You'll get a free, yes, free acute chronic workload calculator. Every Friday, I'm going to send you goodies about what I found on the interwebs and stuff. Those are super cool things that you can get if you sign up for the newsletter. And when I release some products, there will probably be one next year. Um, you are going to get the most discounted stuff. So definitely sign up for my newsletter. Once you've done that, you'll want to click on the online services page. I offer three services currently. The first, a movement consultation. Maybe you're tight and you know, you're not moving as well as you'd like to. Maybe you lack hip rotation. You're wondering, man, that's that couple. He might be on to something. Or maybe you know you uh, you know you got some aches and pains, and uh, you ruled out the bad stuff, and you tried to work with some people, and you weren't getting where you wanted to be. But maybe you're thinking, hey, you know what? If I move a little bit better, that might help me. I can be your guy. We'll go through a session where I assess your movement capabilities. I provide some interventions that will change those movement capabilities. And by cranky, if I don't get changes, we're going to keep going until I do. Until you do. That would be a movement consultation. Definitely sign up for that once you've done that. Maybe you want to learn how to apply the hip rotation stuff with your peeps. 
Maybe you need some help getting compliance with your individuals on some of the stuff that we're doing. Hit me up for the mentorship program. What we'll do for that is we'll have our discussions where we go with some good back and forth, going through concepts, making sure that you are understanding what I'm talking about, meeting you where you're at so we can get you to where you want to be. That would be the mentorship program. Last thing, maybe you just want straight gains. Maybe you're post rehab and you want to increase your fitness levels because you're tired of doing the silly rehab stuff that we do. Hit me up for online training. What that looks like, folks, is we will write a program month to month. I'll give you a free movement consultation in the process. We'll design a program tailored to your specific needs to help meet your specific goals. Definitely hit me up for some online training. Once you've done that, you'll want to find me some other places. Definitely sign up for me on iTunes or Stitcher or both. Search the Zach Couple Show. Because guess what, folks? There's 61 other debriefs that you can listen to. Maybe you don't want to look at me all the time. I get it. There's also some podcasts. There's lots of stuff on there. You definitely want to check me out. And please leave a review. We need the fam to grow larger. Once you've done that, you'll want to follow me on all the social medias. Facebook, right there, dot com forward slash Z Couples. I'm on Twitter. The handle is at Z Couples. And of course, <laughs> that Instagram baby. Zach, Z A C Couples, C U P P L A S. Definitely hit me up on that. And I'm on YouTube if you want a huge exercise database. Just search Zach Couples and you ought to be in business. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. You are beautiful, sexy, outstanding people. I want you to keep it real, but not to the extent when things go wrong. Stay hungry, stay learning, stay moving. And I'll see you next time. Deuces.